Special meeting today, of course, because it includes the Tony Sale Award. You're all very welcome. It's a simple program. I'm going to hand over in a second to my predecessor as chair of the group, that's Rachel, who will take us through the award ceremony. Then I'll introduce the speaker. So, over to you, Rachel. Good afternoon. Professor Martin Campbell Kelly, who's chair of the 2016 Tony Sale Award judging panel, unfortunately can't be here today. So I'm standing in as a member of the judging panel and past chair of the Computer Conservation <coughs> Society. The award was established in honour of the late Tony Sale, perhaps best known for leading the team that rebuilt Colossus, the world's first electronic computer. He was also a key figure in starting the campaign to save Bletchley Park in the early 1990s. He co-founded the National Museum of Computing and jointly established the Computer Conservation Society. The award is to recognise a singular engineering achievement <coughs> in the area of computer conservation and restoration. The judges look for completeness in terms of achieving the project goals, Originality, evidence of a novel approach to conservation or restoration. Ingenuity, any new techniques or processes which were developed. The impact on contributing to understanding the history of computing. And outreach, both to experts and to the general public. As judges, we've been especially pleased at the sheer variety of entries we have received for the Tony Sale Award conservation. This year's winner is quite different from our previous winners, such as Dr. David Link's computer art installation Love Letters, the IBM 1401 experience by the Computer History Museum, and the virtual reconstruction of the German 1930s Z1 mechanical computer. With such diversity and global interest, the Tony Sale Award is providing a great benchmark for the developing science and art of computer conservation. This year, we want to award also a highly commended runner-up certificate. This is for the outstanding project of restoration of a 1960s computer peripheral, an IBM 1403 N1 printer. This was submitted by Vintage IBM Computing Center, Binghamton, New York. They're not unfortunately here with us today. However, as you can see, the 2016 Tony Sale Award for Computer Conservation has been won by the Heinz Nixdorf Museums Forum, Germany, with its interactive, evocative, and educational reconstruction showing how the ENIAC, one of the first electronic computers, was programmed. ENIAC was programmed by plugging wires and turning knobs, a physical skill set quite different from those deployed today. The reconstruction of part of the huge 1946 American computer has the look and feel of the original, but has been simplified to make it readily understood and even programmable by non-specialists. The HNF reconstruction captures the essence of the landmark ENIAC computer, in judging, we were particularly impressed at the thought and planning that went into making the reconstruction accessible to non-specialist audiences. The execution of the ideas produced an artifact that is robust and ideal for a hands-on museum display to demonstrate the physicality of early computer programming. Operating six days a week in the museum, the reconstructed ENIAC accumulator or register in modern terminology, is safe and robust enough to be operated unsupervised by visitors. Modern audiences are bound to be surprised and captivated by the reconstruction. The inspiration was the Heinz Nixdorf Museum Forum's Ada Lovelace Bicentenary celebration because the ENIAC was originally mostly programmed by women. I would like to hand over to Margaret Sale for the presentation of the award to Johannes Blober and Dr. Jochen Fijo of the Heinz Nixdorf Museums Forum. I think if Tony was here today, he'd have a wry smile seeing uh, 
that it says any act up there. There was a great um, kerfuffle around about uh, 1996 when the Mark I Colossus came on stream uh, to get that out and up and in the public view before there was too much fuss about ENIAC. There was a bit of friendly rivalry, but I'm sure that Tony would be really pleased that it's Paddleborn that have, uh, in fact, won the prize this year. We, at uh, the TMOC, we have, in fact, had um, lots of connections with Paddleborn. And, of course, they helped Tony tremendously when he did the big um, cipher challenge, the worldwide cipher challenge, which of course um, was rather hilarious in the fact that the actual winner, the beat Colossus, to actually break that message that Pedagorn sent us, was actually a gentleman from Bonn, just a short distance in fact, from um, Pedagorn and uh, uh, another German. But Tony would have smiled, I would be more than pleased that his friends have been uh, awarded one of those special prizes. Thank you all for coming to see and to hear about the latest um, winner to this prize. As, as Rachel said, we've had a great variety. Aren't you about to come and collect it? <laughs>
area of 6,000 square meters uh, and uh, an additional area for special exhibitions. We have uh, roughly 6,000 objects on display where we lead the visitors really basically uh, through 5,000 years of, of information processing. So starting uh, with the advent of calculating, going over to calculating machines, um, and finally, uh, uh, yeah, talking about, about, about the history. Just two weeks ago, we uh, had our 20th anniversary celebrations. We also opened new areas, and uh, we are, yeah, we are going to to continue for another 20 years. So last year, we had a special exhibition. Um, it was entitled "It Began with Ada." Women in computer history, and the idea was that, um, well, as you, if you have ever been in a, in a lecture of computer scientists, that mostly men, um, and also the history is uh, often uh, told only uh, over uh, the, the achievements of what men have done in, in computers. Um, but we wanted to focus on women because uh, we felt like this is a topic that has not been um, looked at uh, <coughs> in sufficient ways yet. So the special exhibition covered, of course, Ada Lovelace and the analytical engine of Babbage. We showed um, how women were doing a lot of work in, in Bletchley Park in deciphering the, the German uh, messages. Um, we, of course, talked about Ray Sopper, the inventor of the first uh, compiler here working on, on the Unibac. Um, and also, we've covered some, some more recent persons in computer science that uh, had a big influence. But this is not uh, what we're here about uh, today. This was uh, also on the uh, special exhibition. Because, um, as we have already heard, the ENIAC was mainly uh, being programmed by women. And we wanted to show how it was, that was being done. So what were these women actually doing, holding these cables and plugging something there? Um, so we wanted to show that to the audience, what these women were actually doing with, with this machine. So. Maybe uh, before talking about the reconstruction, we did uh, uh, talk shortly about the original, but I guess uh, most of you uh, will, will, will know what this machine was. Um, the thing that struck us mostly about the ENIAC was a very distinct programming model that is so different from what we know now and also different from what was used being uh, back then on, on other machines. Ma uh, namely the, this programming using cables and, and plugs and turning switches <coughs> instead of having it all on a, on a punch card or a punch tape. And uh, here you can see an, an image from the report of the ENIAC where you see the numbers <coughs> are being transferred between accumulators over wires and programming forces are also transferred over wires, namely these lower ones. And um, this was a very special way of, of using and programming a machine. And it was simply be done because the electronic valves uh, that were used here to do the calculations were really fast. Uh, and if you would have uh, had a, uh, had to read in the program by a slow uh, input device reading the punch cards, well, then there would be no use of, this, of the speed. Uh, from these electronic bulbs. And by doing it by hand and transmitting forces over wires, we were able, able to use uh, this machine in a fast way so do calculations really quickly. So we wanted to capture this uh, way of programming. And our goal was to create an experience. We could have also had a touchscreen application where you can drag some, some wires. There exists a uh, very detailed simulation uh, of the ENIAC and we could have shown images and text. But we really wanted 
to capture the physicality of this object. Um, so also the mere size also com took up a complete room. Um, and we also have in our uh, exhibition uh, the Enger shown as it was also in the sides, but only with images on the sides. Um, so we wanted to create this, this experience and let the people really have a physical object that they could touch, where they could turn switches and use cables to uh, experience and by experience uh, the ENIAC really understanding uh, what was happening there. So learning by, by, by doing. Right? If, you, if you have done it once by yourself, it's much more likely that you've understood what's actually happening there and if you just read something. So that was, was our goal and we had some requirements. Uh, first of all, we wanted to have something that could be used by broad audience without any prior knowledge and that was uh, easy enough to to use without being supervised and told what to do um, and we wanted to have it up and running the whole time the museum is open six days a week eight hours uh, and we didn't want to have just a showcase that we show once a day or a couple of times a day and then the audience looks and says ah that's great and then goes on. So that, that was uh, our goals, our requirements, and from these uh, we had to make some, some design decisions. So we wanted to have something to experience. So it was clear we had to have a physical installation. Nothing with a touch screen or a video or something like that, so that you can have this plug and play experience. We wanted to uh, people to understand what was going on. So we had to simplify the design. And this was one of, of the main workloads, really, thinking about how do we simplify the design. Um, because, well, we didn't want to make it too simple, because then, well, uh, the, the knowledge gain that you can get would be too little but uh, we didn't want to have one complicated machine that would just scare pe uh, people to use it. So that was really a big trade-off. We had a lot of discussions. Um, some saying, no, if we leave uh, this part out, that would be historically incorrect. Others saying, but if we take it in, then it's too complicated. So we had very vivid discussions about it. Um, and I guess we found a good, good compromise. And since the actual ENIAC uh, consisted of multiple units um, and that would have been too complex. We merged multiple parts into one housing. But, and the reliability, um, we had discussions, should we use real electronic valves um, inside? But that was basically out of question because they are not reliable enough and we <coughs> didn't want to have uh, such a high uh, maintenance of this machine um, and the, the housing itself, the cables had to be robust enough to be used on a daily basis. So this is a drawing from the original ENIAC accumulator. What you see here is you have the display using neon lamps showing what's currently stored inside the accumulator. You have the digit trays um, where the numbers were being transferred by. Nowadays you would call it a bus. You have the control panel with uh, the, the plugs and, and all the controlling uh, interfaces to program what the accumulator was supposed to do. And you have the programming trays where program poses were being sent to uh, start certain operations. And we come up with this design. It's a little bit hard to see on the projection. What we did is, with one accumulator, you can't really do much, right? So we uh, had two accumulators in one housing, and instead of taking 10 numbers for each, we just have five. Uh, digit number for each accumulator. So it's split in the middle. 
um, so we can store two numbers and transfer it between the accumulators. The digit trays uh, are, well, we don't need that many, and they are simplified. The original ones have these large 11 pin connectors. Uh, we have just simple audio jacks um, for robustness and simplicity. The control panels were cleaned up. The original ENIAC had 12 programs that uh, you could program um, and configure. Ours just have one. Um, so you can You can, um, it's not too visible, but I'll show you a video later. Uh, you have these plugs to receive and send numbers. You have a repetition switch. And with these two toggle switches, you decide what the operation is receiving or sending a number. And to get numbers into the accumulators, uh, at the start, we also added a constant transmitter, where you could set a constant number and then transfer it to the accumulators. And in so the real machine then looks like that. So we decided to use real neon lamps for the display um, because well they are reliable enough to, to run on a full uh, day basis, and it just looks so much better than using LEDs. So it was more effort in designing the electronics. But that really paid off, and that was something that we could could uh, do without <coughs> too much uh, effort on the maintenance. Um, and all all these uh, plaques with all the numbers uh, on it were um, hand, handmade by us. Um, and what you can you can maybe see it on on the close shots. We uh, decided to use this black wrinkle pin was very common back then to have this uh, real touch and feel of, of the machine. <coughs> and you would think that, well, the, the choosing of the paint is, is an easy thing. Actually, it turned out to be quite difficult to get that painted. Um, when we decided on it, we've asked uh, multiple companies around in Parabon, can you handle such a wrinkle paint? And they said, no problem. Um, when we finally found this paint in Switzerland, it wasn't too easy. And suddenly everyone was like, oh, no, no, we don't know how to handle that. Uh, except for one company, and they took multiple tries to get this uh, done properly, because that's just a technology um, paint that isn't used anymore, and the knowledge how to handle that properly isn't there anymore. So on the first version, you could really scratch off the paint because they didn't, didn't apply it properly. Um, but finally, they got it. It's robust. It looks really, really good, and has this nice uh, texture that adds a lot on on the, uh, on the machine. And also the, the buttons. Uh, <coughs> if you looked around to get the real feeling, they shouldn't be too soft, so that you really have the, the haptics uh, of, of this machine. This is an overview uh, of the electronic, which was uh, designed by Gregor Rolopex from the museum. We uh, decided to use modern day hardware, so we designed PCBs and used uh, standard uh, logic gates, shift registers um, to, to have a robust solution. Uh, it is all controlled by a microcontroller on an Arduino board. And we've designed it in a modular way so that if parts fail, we can easily exchange them. So the accumulator display units, you see, that are separate boards that are just daisy chained. And if one fails, we can just uh, remove it and, and put in a, uh, a spare part. Um, and the, the switch board and plug connector boards used for reading in the input um, are also designed in a, in a modular fashion and then read in serially. I will show you on, on the next slide uh, a bit more detail how we did that. Um, and what we had to take care of uh, was the high voltage used for the neon lamps because it was supposed to be used by a broad audience and if you handle high voltages, you really have to be careful. Um, and we separated this part from all the other things and made sure that, that there's no chance of, of 
coming close to this high voltage So here's one example for uh, how we did read-in of the cabling. So we have a lot of plugs and we can connect them via cables. And the way we did it was basically each, each plug uh, can serve as input and as output. And I just uh, try out every plug by sending a signal. Um, and if I do so, the plug is being grounded by this transistor. Otherwise, there's 5 volts on it. And then I can read it out. Now, if the plug is not connected to any of the others, all of uh, the other plugs will read a 1 because they are tied to 5 volt. And only the one I'm currently triggering, triggering will go to 0. If, on the other hand, uh, this plug is connected by a cable to others, then this, uh, this other plug will also be put to ground and therefore we can read in a 0. Um, that, that was quite a nice way to, to uh, get the input of this cabling into, into the microcontroller. And as you can see here, um, we had to take care of using diodes to make sure that it's not ESD sensitive. There are all of these things that you really have to keep in mind if you want to have it uh, be robust and uh, usable by everyone. The software is based on uh, the Arduino platform and is written in C. So what it basically does is it <coughs> reads in the input, checks whether anything is happening, and then outputs uh, the new configuration. So reading in means uh, checking how are the switches set, how is this cabling done. Um, we've used, used uh, multiplexes and demultiplexes to deserialize and serialize it. Um, and also for writing the output, uh, it's all then being serially and uh, used on a microcontroller, we can also easily change it. We have, for example, also a screensaver program. So if nothing is happening to the machine, it suddenly starts doing stuff on its own. Uh, so we get people interested in that if there's just a machine, but maybe they just go by, but if they see, well, that's something blinking, let's have a look at that. Um, and yeah, so it's not hardwired, but easily being, being programmed, so we can uh, easily change uh, how, how specifically it behaves. Now, let's see if I can get the video up and running, because showing images is quite nice, but to really see it in action, we prepared a video. <coughs> Uh, where I will explain shortly again the parts of the INIAC and will do a simple calculations, namely uh, the uh, calculation of Fibonacci numbers, which will take roughly five minutes. Um, and I'm sorry for the, the quality, I hope it is sufficient. Loud. Hi, I'm Johannes Globe from the Heinz Nixdorf Computer Museum in Paderborn, Germany, and this is our ENIAC reconstruction. So what we have here is a simplified uh, module of the accumulator, which was the, one of the main parts of the complete ENIAC. We have two accumulators in, in one housing, so that we can actually do some, some calculations with it. It's constructed as following. We have one accumulator, here with five digits, and the second accumulator with five digits, instead of one with ten digits. We have our digit tray, over which we can transmit numbers. Then we have the control panel, with which we can determine what the accumulators will do. So if they will receive or if they will send their number, how often they will do it, and these are the plugs for receiving or sending a number. Down here we also included a constant transmitter where we can set a fixed number and send it over this plug to the accumulators. The sending is triggered by this button and we can reset it with the reset button. Now currently we have a screensaver program running. If we reset it, 
it's all set to zero, and now I want to show you how to how to use this machine. We have these cables to transmit numbers. Um, so to transmit a number to the accumulators, we have to connect the send port of the constant transmitter with the uh, receiving ports of the accumulators. So I want to show you how to calculate the Fibonacci numbers using the ENIAC. So we first connect with one cable to the digit tray and then we connect both accumulators from the digit tray to the receiving port. We configure it to receive a number by toggling the switches. And we uh, say that we want to send a constant by toggling on this switch. The constant I want to send now is just the number one. So if I press now the send button, the number is transferred to both accumulators. We don't need the constant transmitter anymore for calculating the Fibonacci numbers. We're just going to transmit the number from one accumulator to the other and then vice versa. And in each step, the number is being added to the previous one. So we don't need a cable for the constant transmitter anymore. We just connect the send port from accumulator one and the receive port from accumulator two and vice versa. And now we start sending first from accumulator one to accumulator two. Those adding the number to the second one, and it looks like that. The number here is uh, cycled through the accumulator 10 times. Those at the end, the same number will stay here. And then the one which was standing here has been transmitted and added to the second accumulator. Now we just reverse directions, press the send button again, and so the number is now sent from the second accumulator to the first one, and now we get the Fibonacci numbers. We started with one, one, and we have two, three, and we can go on. <coughs> the speed is very low, of course, in the original ENIAC it was way, way faster, but we wanted the visitors to be able to actually see how the numbers are being transmitted, and also the manual switching was not present in the original ENIAC, but here for simplicity um, it is done like that. And as you can see, we calculate the Fibonacci numbers with our Fibonacci. Um, today only me and Jochen are here, but we were not the only ones working on it. Um, that was really a, a group project. Uh, we had a lot of help from, from many people in the museum, namely Rainer Glaschek, who uh, many of you also know. Uh, he had the ideas or had some, some uh, first ideas on how to do the simplification had many designs that we were able to discuss <coughs> and help with the electronics and, and with, um, with examples what could actually be programmed with it. Bernhard von and Norbert Fischer with the whole housing and uh, the, yeah, the <coughs> uh, of it. Gregor Gorenbeck, um, if you give him a soldering iron, he can do anything and he did all the electronics. <laughs> And he's not afraid, afraid to, to handle this high voltage uh, thing. <laughs> and Sie uh, Gonzato and Dr. Stefan Stein for the Hartmann also helped in uh, getting it all done into one final piece that can be shown in the uh, museum. So, oh, you can't actually see that on there, right? Yeah, anyhow. Uh, 
um, did we did we receive uh, the, the, did we achieve what we what we wanted to do? Um, so we wanted to have something that people can experience and really try out. And as you just have seen, I guess we did that and, and really plug and play. Um, understanding, well, we haven't done any interviews to, to visitors, um, so we don't know for sure, but um, from, from what we have seen so far, um, many people do have some, some problems understanding it, so maybe we have to um, add some more explanations, maybe some, some videos, um, but I guess it's the design we came up with was a good compromise. Um, and it's simple enough so people can actually understand it. And it's now uh, working since last year, um, October 2015, the uh, special exhibition started. And ever since, <coughs> it had just minor failures and some neon tubes had to be removed, but nothing too much. So it is a reliable device that I really can use. Um, and yeah. That's, that's it from my side. Um, thank you for your attention. Tom Haig and Mark Priestley recently published a book on ENIAC, which is a kind of revisionist account um, describing that the ENIAC was actually much more sophisticated than was first thought. I wondered if there was any material from that, those researchers would, that would um, require you to modify. Now, was, was there anything new that came out of that work that changed your ideas of, of technically what ENIAC could do? What did it meant was more sophisticated? Um, so they were arguing, uh, well, I wondered whether there was technical material that wasn't known before. In other words, it, 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 is, is everything known about how any app worked in terms of circuit diagrams, components, and all the rest of it? Uh, I guess it's pretty good to understand, I suppose. Yes. Um, but I don't know whether it's up to a level that you could do a real reconstruction <coughs> of this was well. Um, whenever I see a thing with just two registers, I'm always tempted to make it draw circles. Um, if you can subtract the one accumulator shifted down off the other, then add the one accumulator at shifted down to the other. So both are shifted down, but you actually solve the differential equation. The sine the differential of sine is cos, which is a cos minus sine. And it will draw circles if you just let it run. So is there any ability to shift down before you add? Usually you can add, you show them add. Is there any ability to shift down so many places in there now? Mm, not with this installation. Yeah. Okay, also, sub subtraction. So, the original ENIAC did the subtraction with a tense complement yeah. that was being generated automatically. Yeah, um, and here we have an explanation, um, also shortly explaining what is a tense complement, and then you really have to set it to, to this one. <coughs> but yeah, the shifting is not implemented. But but in its software, you could think of uh, implementing it, but that's not yeah. So the, the, the audience for this is more a public, broad audience, not experts who want to do real sophisticated programs. On it. That's what you have to simulate it for, right? Yeah. Well, in parallel, this is the Meccano computer, the differential in that kind of uh, it's in um, Auckland, at the moment, but what we can do, that does draw circles. That's the only time you can keep it. So stay on it. Mm. Any other questions? Please. You said that visitors didn't quite understand what you wanted them to understand. Is that right? Or can you explain what you will be asking them to assess whether they've understood or not? What are they supposed to be understanding? Um, the main thing we wanted them to understand is um, First of all, that these accumulators were storage and arithmetic units uh, in one, one device, um, which is quite distinct from, from what we have now. Um, so 
so this, this combined functionality, and then that I can, um, yeah, do calculations by transferring numbers. Um, so that's what we we wanted to grasp, and yeah, it's, it's we don't have. Do we have any more information about how people see it? Um, you know more about that. Yeah, we of course we. Um, uh, a close look to the, the people operating this machine and what we uh, very often realize is uh, that for instance a kid is attracted by the machine uh, because there's there's someone just operating the cables so the, the uh, kid is uh, checking what's going on in this installation and then it starts to do anything and uh, it, she or he does not understand what's going on in, in this machine. And then, so there's this request for dad or mom. So what's <laughs> going on here? Yeah? And then you very often see um, a combined team, a team uh, working through the explanation because then the, the dad, for instance, is uh, attracted by the machine and it's just thinking, well, we start not with the Fibonacci numbers. Our starting program is just to add two numbers. It's a very simple task, uh, but nevertheless, you have to start with the first number from the constant generator, put it to one accumulator to the next one, and then you see uh, a nice way of teamwork. Um, this we see, uh, so, so we, re we realize very often this, this behavior. But on the other hand, I think there is um, space left for improvements, for further development. <coughs> Um, so we're just getting started to enlarge our INIAC display and um, many of you know that we have uh, rebuilt the, the original space of the, of the machine at scale one to one and we have four um, original parts from the Smithsonian uh, Institution on display in our museum and now we, and of course we have the uh, INIAC on a ship, this project uh, this was done in 1986 um, for the 50th uh, anniversary of the INIAC. So a group from Pennsylvania uh, rebuilt the INIAC as the full machine on a silicium chip. So at the size of 3 millimeters times 3 millimeters. Um, a nice project. And so we have this uh, display uh, and we have the um, Accumulator interactive, and I think we should uh, further develop this this very interesting um, presentation of the first purely electronic, not really programmable computer. So I uh, leave it to the experts uh, if this is the first computer or not. So it's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, uh, uh, many many years ago. I discovered that I could understand analog computers and was drafted into teaching the subject, even though I had not used them in anger, except, of course, when you program an analog computer, the anger can't be far away. <laughs> <laughs> but th this machine, about which I know not a lot, seems to be such a curious place between the analog computer and the classic von Neumann uh, digital computer. And lots of the people who actually come to your machine must surely be familiar with the modern von Neumann architecture. And I wonder, have you got any feel for how they react to this and how they try, try to understand what's going on when you understand what modern von Neumann computers work like? It's probably more difficult than it was for people who've never seen either. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, um, so the ENIAC was not a von Neumann architecture. That's right. Um, but in, in constructing them and seeing how it's difficult to do all this plugging, this idea of a stored program computer was actually, um, was born. And um, also by, by Eckhart and Motley, who, who designed the original ENIAC. Um, so I, I guess if you, if you see how this was being done, you quickly come to the conclusion that the von Neumann architecture is much easier to handle. Oh, yeah. um, so, so maybe that does help. But I'm not even sure if most of the audience is actually 
know what the fundamental architecture is or how a computer works at all. Uh, they, they all, or many, many, I guess, use them, except true or that, that, certainly in the UK, there is quite a shift away from teaching kids to use PowerPoint into teaching kids to understand computers. Yeah. So you may also find that your audience shifts in its base knowledge over the next 10, 20 years. That's completely right. Uh, and so we do a lot of activities. As Johannes mentioned, uh, we are not only a computer museum, but a forum. So that means this is a location um, where you can experience many different aspects of the digital transformation that is currently going on. So, and of course, we are doing workshops on analog computers, so uh, this is another topic. Uh, but you can do it once a week or once a month, uh, because the, the, we have a telephone um, and a EAS uh, analog computer in operation, and we demonstrate simple programs like the moon landing, uh, well, which is a very uh, simple differential equation we are going to solve. But this is a, a special supervised workshop uh, event. Mm -hmm. And you can do this uh, within the museum. This is uh, our uh, approach. The next point is um, I completely agree that we have to tell the young people that it's not sufficient just to consume the uh, professional produced media products from a uh, few American companies. So uh, this is a very interesting point and I know that the UK uh, did a lot of work in this direction just to tell young people that the elementary school for instance or at the secondary school, come on, it's, it's not sufficient to just use the commercial software. It's a question of designing and to bring in the own creativity and own ideas, and, and that these devices allow to, um, to, to design the future of our society. And this is the very point when we try to follow up the uh, UK um, efforts in this direction. So there is a, there's a lot of uh, effort going on at the moment. We talk to the Ministry of Education, uh, but it's pretty hard. <laughs> Is there a, a, a question? Um, David almost asked my question and you almost answered the question I haven't asked yet. But when you are producing something like this, to simplify an idea, to get an idea over to your public audience, which can be of any age and any experience, having designed it and built it, how do you feel kind of marks out of 10 that you got the message over? Only you will know, so. <laughs> <laughs> you could say 12, but. <laughs> Successful? I, I, I would say so, yes. In that case, and you designed it properly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. So, you. you uh, clearly laid out some uh, some goals that you need to achieve to uh, to say that you've completed the project that you're going for. Can I ask how much debate or arguments there was between the purists and the and the people who wanted uh, the ex exhibition to to work? Uh, was it, was it an easy process or was it a long no. process? <laughs> 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 not, not at all. It, it wasn't. It wasn't easy, but. Uh, it was fun. Now, after doing it, it's easy to say so. But it, it was really a challenge. And you, we really had to put a lot of effort and thought into that. Uh, and finding, finding a, a right, a sweet spot, a, a compromise. Um, and I, I had a lot of fun discussing it, even though sometimes a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to budget. <laughs> I can see why it's obviously a very popular exhibit. I mean, it's, it's really great. Um, I may have missed the point, but um, do you just let people play with it, or do you have sort of worked examples and crib sheets around the back that they can 
experiment with where they know which pipes go where. Yeah, right, right yeah. next to it, there's a detailed explanation with images and hand drawing. Really put the plug there and do it there. And so in the process, they maybe do not know yet why they do it. But then by doing it, you, you come to an understanding. Uh, and that, that's a really a step by step. Uh, I, I thought you'd need that rather than just being confronted with a, a lot of wires and not knowing quite yeah, what it is. Absolutely. It's not that simple. Then we would have reduced it to a send button and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> but how often do the cables disappear? <laughs> <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Uh, interestingly, we do not have a vandalism problem. Uh, so, because many people uh, always think about, so when we use um, small bricks uh, to explain uh, the basics of coding, for instance, and everyone was uh, warning us, so do not use these small bricks, and they will take them away and steal them. Um, it's, a, it's a good uh, souvenir, but we do not see this behavior. Um, this is good news. So we have other exhibits. Um, they are open for vandalism. So especially when they, when they, in, well, these objects invite people to act in a in a brute force manner, for instance, to so hit the button or whatever. So, but uh, so the visitors are very careful, uh, carefully uh, working with this. Although we observe very often that kids just start to plug and play uh, the cable without understanding anything. So, but it's a good starting point. <laughs> Your question. Uh, <coughs> having, I just wonder why you've only got one panel, whether you make another panel, because I, I, I think that the idea of, of swapping data from one to the other and backwards and forwards, as, as you did in that demonstration, makes it slightly hard to understand what's going on. I just think that going from one panel to the next to the next would be, uh, from a teaching point of view, perhaps easier to understand. And I imagine that having once built one of them, uh, the, the next two or three would be the next machine. Uh, well, the, the answer is rather simple. Um, we haven't had more space in the, uh, in the display of the yin yang. But, uh, so when we realized that this could uh, <coughs> could en enrich the the, the uh, experience of interaction, then we think we could think about uh, a new panel. So this could be a, a good idea. Some time ago, Goran Swade wrote about the Science Museum that in the 1950s and 1960s, it was a place you could go and you could turn a wheel and you see things happening and you might just learn something. I think you have to be congratulated for going back to that model of the museum. Yeah. It's a very yeah. brave thing to do. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's one point I would like to answer here, um, because we had this in the interview before. Um, I think when, when we opened the computer museum 20 years ago, it was a new experience to use touch screens to uh, go into a detailed information tree or whatever. So this was fancy at that time. But this is not the point today. So all kids are completely familiar with swiping and, and touching. And this is, this is not the, the, the interesting thing anymore. And then it requires a lot of good design to uh, make good interactive touchscreen application. Well, this is my personal uh, belief. And it's much easier if you have a completely different interaction scheme. So it's much more um, uh, accessible if you really turn the crank or if you really turn the wheels and see what's going on on the, on the uh, mechanical level. Um, I think uh, we should, in a certain sense, go one step back to uh, offer real interactive uh, tangible experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, uh, I'd like to thank you both, not just for a brilliant and very clear lecture, beautifully given, but for <coughs> answering the questions. Is that something?
very challenging, but it's clear that everybody's learned something, and that's surely the best outcome of any discussion like this. So thank you very much indeed, and also again, congratulate you on obviously a very well run award. Thank you.